in terms of material, I'm condensing the latter chapters into something that is sort of a, a context. Uh, we are certainly looking still at organic molecules, and I would argue that the organic molecules will get bigger and bigger as they have to for biology and things like polymer chemistry. And the way I've taken, you know, the approach I've taken here is to split it into two different uh, formats. I've, I've set these things as biomolecules, as chemistry and water, which is biology and biochemistry. And then the last chapter that I deal with, 27, is the opposite. It's chemistry, which involves nonpolar molecules that don't dissolve in water, typically, like plastics. And we'll talk about polymers next week. But thinking about where we are here, you can see how nature has developed these remarkably simple, yet complex, if that makes any sense, systems to do various jobs. And a lot of what you'll have to learn in the future is about communication. It's about molecules talking to each other and recognizing each other, and then maybe combining or reacting or docking, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and I've collected these ideas together from the, the three chapters here uh, based on the different polarities. You can see at the top, lipids, which we'll get to Friday, are very nonpolar, so they can cause problems in aqueous solution because maybe they precipitate, which causes all sorts of issues. And things like amino acids, you'll see uh, very diverse, lots of different functional groups, and that would be things for like uh, acid catalysts and base catalysts. You'll need different functional groups there. Uh, and we, we talked about carbohydrates on Monday, the idea of them be, being very polar. And if they're very polar, they ought to present themselves to aqueous environments. They ought to be at the surface of a cell. They ought to be able to dissolve, the, dissolve in water, and they, indeed they do. So today we'll carry on with this idea of, of carbohydrate molecules, and we'll deal with nucleic acids. Now, if you've taken any basic biology class, you should know about DNA and RNA. You should know about the alphabet and a little bit about things like Hoogstein-based pairing. Um, I just want to point this out from the perspective of a, of a chemist. And I'm teaching a class again, uh, that I've not taught before. It's a biological chemistry class, which has been fascinating because it's amazing how nature replicates what we do in lab and how, what, how we replicate what nature does, uh, often without knowing. Uh, there are re reactions in nature that we've developed in the lab without knowing they were in, in natural sources, and then vice versa. And so nature continues to be sort of an inspiration for what we do. We're often looking at target molecules based on their medicinal properties or their, uh, their, their material properties. Uh, and, and nature is, is, a, is a big sort of inspiration for uh, that type of target. So the nucleic acids themselves, you can see at the bottom right here, they are fairly complex. They're more complex than, say, the lipid at the top because they have many more functional groups. And you'll notice that they are, again, very polar. You have lots of possibilities here for hydrogen bonding, so they ought to dissolve in water. And, of course, they do. Uh, we'll talk about two types here, really. We'll talk about the uh, nucleic acids, which have the hydroxyl right there, and then the deoxy version and just very quickly talk about their chemistry and, and what you should expect to see in the, on the final, maybe, if you're looking at one of these molecules. So very carefully, or very quickly, we can think about um, the alphabets that have been developed to uh, transfer information, to make proteins, to go from DNA to RNA to protein, things like that. Uh, it's a fairly simple alphabet, and people are trying to duplicate this or replicate it and develop novel alphabets. People are trying to make synthetic DNA and RNA with different bases, and, and people are making good strides on that. Uh, we've got very simple materials over here, which are indeed um, nitrogen bases. They are compounds that contain nitrogen in various places. They are amides. They're held together by amide bonds. You can imagine making these things in the lab by doing the type of chemistry we've seen, by taking acid chlorides, reacting with amines, and you make yourself an amide. That's, that's often how these things are made. Uh, but the alphabet itself, you know, you, you can think about biology now, and, and part of the turnoff with some of these things is the fact that it's all acronyms. You, you develop all this detail in chemistry, you go back to biology, and all of a sudden everything's an acronym. DNA, RNA, uh, CGTA, and all this stuff. Well, we have to be aware that these things are real chemicals and have some idea of their chemical properties. So if you were to look at some of these systems, I, I would ask you as a chemist, there's, there's an NH2 group. You know from your experience here that an NH bond has a typical pK of what? 38. Very high. It's very difficult to deprotonate those things. But as you start to get more subtle and you look at some of the later stuff we did in the later chapters, you can start to see why that proton on that molecule isn't 38. It's actually a lot lower. Any ideas why? If you take that proton off, what can you do with the charge? You can delocalize. You can, de you can delocalize, absolutely. So the pKa is, is dropping dramatically. It's very much like aniline. It's very much like NH2 on a benzene ring. You can see now that the cycle next to it has something to say about the chemical properties of the material outside. So you, you can work your way through here. You can see amide bonds. You can see a carbonyl. You can see uh, a species over here which has a double bond next to an N. That's an enamine. And these molecules react as such. They react with those types of chemical functionalities in biochemistry. There are really two types of bases that you need to worry about. When we say base, it's this unfortunate term that's been uh, carried through biochemistry and biology. They are basic, but we refer to them as bases. Um, you have the six-membered rings called the pyrimidines, and you have these. Uh, bicyclic systems called purines. 
and you will see a little bit about how they're made and how they're recycled in biochemistry when you take that. Uh, we have two alphabets. We have DNA, which you'll see in a second involves um, a deoxy sugar, and you have the RNA alphabet, which involves a hydroxylated material. And we'll see a very similar setup in which uh, the cytosine repeats itself on the right. I don't need to memorize these things. You'll have to do that in biochemistry. Uh, guanine repeats itself. Adenine repeats itself. But the only difference, really, is this little methyl group. Yeah? The real difference here in terms of the basic structure is a hydrogen being swapped for a CH3 group. And when you come to see how that works, it's a, it's a methylation reaction. You need a methyl transfer reagent like you would see in the lab, and that's pretty much how that's made. So keep an eye on these things, not necessarily as biomolecules. This is obviously seeing what you'll see in the future, but as organic chemists, organic molecules. So if we put the sugar on there and we make the nucleic acid, we're now looking more realistic in terms of building polymers, building RNA or DNA. If you had to tell me as a chemist what the approximate pK of that OH group was, what would it be? 16, absolutely. And the idea of the deoxy means that we've got rid of an OH group right there. And the mechanism for that is quite interesting. You can learn that in biochemistry or if you take my class next spring. Uh, we've got the, um, in this case, it's the DNA alphabet. So the D means deoxy. Basically, you've taken out a hydroxyl group. But you can see, again, we have some interesting structures here. We have uh, this carbon, a, a situation which has an O attached, and it has an N attached. It's almost like an acetal. It's, it's somewhere between. I call it an aminal. And it has similar properties. It will be acid stable, or sorry, it'll be acid sen sensitive, but base stable. And how you get there by coupling those two pieces together is a simple glycosylation reaction involving a carbyl cation, like an SN2 reaction, SN1 reaction. Uh, so these structures are, are, are quite elegant. You can see now all of these different uh, possibilities for hydrogen bonding. You've got lone pairs here, you've got NH here, NH2 here, lone pairs here. These molecules can find each other and communicate. And if there's one big idea that's been sort of taken off, has taken off since I started this about 30 years ago, it's this idea of communication, non-covalent communication. Thinking about how molecules talk to each other without bonding to each other. They can use hydrogen bonding to recognize each other. And that is, is enough glue to hold things together to let something else happen like a, a catalytic event. So the opposite now for the RNA alphabet. Uh, the only difference now is we've taken off a methyl group. We've put on a hydrogen here in the uridine. And we're still stuck with all of these different things, all of which are built in order to communicate. Now, if you haven't had biology, don't worry. This is simple chemistry. You expect these things to hydrogen bond. They ought to hydrogen bond to water, so they ought to be soluble in water. But they also ought to be able to hydrogen bond to each other, which is what I'll show you in a second. Now, I brought this slide in because people are registering. They're thinking they're asking about next year, um, not necessarily the spring, but let's, let's put it in there anyway. Uh, I'm teaching this class now. It's got 20-odd people in it. It seems to be quite popular. It is not biochemistry. It is the organic chemistry of biological molecules. We have a unique perspective as organic chemists looking at any type of system, because at least a carbon-based system, because we know about mechanism. We know about bond strengths. We know about how things come together and how long they last, whether they're robust or whether they're labile. So you might be interested in this. It's only a two-credit hour class. It's an upper division elective. It's a very good prep if you're taking the MCAT or the PCAT. We, we just do mechanism after mechanism. And you do organic reaction after organic reaction. Okay, from a different perspective, it'll just be biomolecules. That could be fun. And you can see now some types of systems that you, 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 you've seen already. This is an upper division slash graduate level class. But all these reactions we have covered in this semester. We just apply them now to bigger molecules. How do we make this down here? This is uridine monophosphate, which is one of the molecules I just showed you, with a phosphate group attached out here. Well, we have to build a cycle, and we have to stick a sugar on there. So we take this material, amino acid, and we take this carbon oil phosphate, and we couple them together. And if I asked you what that functional group is, what is it? It's an amide. And you make amides pretty much exclusively in this class by nucleophilic acyl substitution, by attacking a carbonyl maybe some proton transfers, maybe a leaving group breaking off. And what about this thing here? What do you think this is behaving as? That's a leaving group. Now, we can't use chloride as a leaving group in nature because you get HCl, and that's dangerous. That's poisonous. But phosphate is a very good source of a leaving group because it's resonance stabilized when it breaks off. So this type of chemistry is fairly straightforward. You make your cycle. Then you might have to do some different uh, manipulations to get the cycle finished. If I asked you as a, as a chemist at this stage of your lives, what is happening between this molecule and this molecule? What type of chemical reaction? It looks like an elimination, doesn't it? An elimination. Now, biology does some things that we find difficult to do in the lab. All of a sudden, hydride, H minus, becomes a, a reasonable leaving group, as long as you have somewhere for it to go. And you get some interesting things that we can't do. But you'll see, certainly, that that's an oxidation reaction in which we lose a hydrogen here, we lose one at the top, and we put the double bond in. And at the end of this, we, 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 we're going to put the uh, phosphate on, we're going to put the sugar on, 
And then we get this remarkable reaction. This is, I, I chose, chose this by random, but this happens to be the fastest enzyme catalyzed reaction that's known. It has a ridiculous acceleration rate versus the non catalyzed process. And you can learn about that in biochem. But these are simple organic reactions. The whole point of this is to make sure that you understand these are fairly simple reactions that you have done. And when you get into biochem, remember that. It isn't all just new information. So in terms of communication, huge deal. In terms of talking across space, talking across solutions, in which you have this setup. The, the DNA or RNA fragments are all set up. Uh, next week, I'll talk about polymers, in which we add one block to another to make two, and then a third one, a fourth one, a fifth one, a millionth one, and make bigger molecules. You can do that in biology. We see here that we have some linkages. The actual chemical linkage that holds these things together is this, a phosphate, and that's an ester. That's a fairly simple type of system. And we can see some free hydroxyls here might be useful. We can maybe tag something onto there if we need to. And we have the bases. And I think of this system like a, an aircraft carrier. You know, an aircraft carrier is just a platform which carries people, and it carries aircraft, and it carries weapons. And you can think now that this system here is just the aircraft carrier. And what's being delivered into space is this stuff. This is the chemical information that's being pushed out into space to be able to communicate with whatever's across the way. And whatever's across the way tends to be the other strand. And as long as you have a good match, and everything matches in terms of their hydrogen bonding possibilities, you'll get uh, duplexes and triplets, uh, helices and stuff like that. So here's a simple example of that. This, I believe, is called hoogstein based pairing. You've probably heard of that before. But it's nothing more complicated than a nice match of hydrogen bonds. And you can see now, if you put guanine next to cyphidine, you've got all this stuff. You've got three possible hydrogen bonds. And don't forget, all the way back to the beginning, a hydrogen bond is worth about three kilocalories per mole. So you start adding this up, you get like a zipper effect. You start adding these bits and pieces together, all this glue holding these molecules together, in a non-covalent sense, there are no bonds being formed here, you get a strong bond. Okay? You get a, a really strong interaction if you start to add these things up very much like a zipper. So um, I hope that moves. Is it going to move? Move. It's not going to move. This is just to show where my sort of take at the sophomore level stops and where biochemistry takes over. And it's all about scale. And the problem with scale is that communicating scale is very difficult in a meaningful way. We have learned in my class, you know, to the nth degree, that detail really matters. And that if you miss atoms out or miss bonds out, uh, it costs you. And we find now that organic chemists are very comfortable with this type of structure. I can see atoms. I can see functional groups. I know as a chemist that if I treat this with base, maybe my phosphate breaks open because I get a saponification reaction. I treat it with acid. Maybe my nitrogen breaks off, something like that. That's fine as a chemist. But for the majority of you going forward into the biological type stuff, you then have to deal with these types of things. And you just can't draw every atom. It's impossible. You can't see every atom because they're all overlapping because most of these molecules are huge and three-dimensional. So you have to get used to the different communication devices. And you'll see now that as you go into the bigger subjects, that becomes a bit of a pain. You're used to detail. You want to see the atoms. You want to know the mechanisms. You just don't have time. So some of you have already seen this, uh, this sort of central dogma of um, protein replication, stuff like that, the idea that you can take these very complex but elegant molecules like RNA and DNA and then turn them into proteins. You code for different proteins. And, and that's some, all I'm going to say about that because it's not my area. But you've got this beautiful cyclical system in the sense that things will uh, be recycled and used in different ways to make carbohydrates, to make proteins, to make lipids. And that chemistry is biochemistry. Plus this class I'm teaching next spring if you're interested in that. So in terms of that nucleic acid bit, it's just an extension of carbohydrates. Uh, you've got to be happy with the fact that they are simple organic molecules and have some opinion about them, if I ask you that type of question. So going on, chapter 25. Now there is no homework for 24, 25, 26. I'm done with the online stuff. There is 23 stuff out there to do. Uh, the problem with these latter chapters is they are dense. They're sort of nebulous. And if I just pick out a few little things, uh, the homework won't, won't make any sense. So go ahead and read these slides and have an appreciation for them as, as chemicals. But that's about it. Now, amino acids. You will not be able to get away from this, uh, even if you're engineers, right? You've, you've got to start thinking in a bigger sense, uh, opening up the possibilities. Engineering isn't just about plastics and oil, right? There's a lot of alternative fuel type stuff out there that could, you could think about. Um, amino acids now are the alphabet to put together for proteins. And they are more complex than, say, uh, lipids, but not as complex as the carbohydrates. They don't have as many functional groups. And you think of these things as an alphabet. You know, we've got 26 letters in the alphabet. You put them together to make infinite words. You've got 20 amino acids. You can put them together to make infinite different structures with different lengths, 
or different uh, branches sticking off, and you can start talking about um, making proteins. So I've got some slides here again to sort of put a period or a full stop at the end of where I finish and then transition into biology. And this slide, this slide is one of my favorites because it, I think it sets up the difference between the disciplines and part of the problem with the difference in the disciplines. It would be great if everybody thought like a scientist and an engineer and a biologist, right? And had all of those different skills, those, those different types of thinking to be able to communicate. I'm a chemist, so I like analysis. I like seeing structure, I like seeing detail. I like I can ask them the question, why is this happening chemically? Engineers, why do you like being an engineer? What's so good about being an engineer? You can build stuff, presumably. You get to design stuff and build stuff. That's kind of fun. And for physicians, pharmacists, teachers, whatever else, there's something about the subject that you, you, you latched onto. But the problem is the way we teach this stuff and the way we learn it, it's very much sort of silo-based. I'm a chemist, I'm over here. You're an engineer, you're over there. And it's very rare that we communicate. But what, the, you know, what we're trying to do these days is get people to talk to each other and learn as they go. So that at the end of the day, you're cross-discipline and you can communicate with all types of different people. Well, this slide kind of shows why that's a problem. On the left is organic chemistry. I can see atoms. I'm happy with the molecule on the left. I can see blue atoms for nitrogen, I can see red for oxygen, I can see gray for carbon. That's my world. I'm happy in it, thank you. And then you get into biochemistry. And the molecules get bigger. You just don't have the time or the possibility to draw all the atoms. And you have to start abbreviating. And those abbreviations become, I'm not sure what that is. It's like a, a twisted thing, right? But it's supposed to represent the molecule on the left. You've taken out all the extraneous information that apparently isn't needed, and you're left with the backbone. Now take that a step further from biochemistry into biology, where you put all these systems together and you start talking about uh, physiology, you start talking about disease and things like that. You don't have time to draw those things. And things all of a sudden become these elegant ribbons. You talk about helices and beta pleated sheets and things like that. And those motifs have their own communication device. So you're going to have to transfer, transfer and sort of um, remember along the way that these are all the same thing. But they're all from different subjects and quite often we don't communicate well enough across those subjects. So there's one of my favorite pictures. It's a, uh, a uh, catalyst. No, in fact, not it's a catalyst. It's not a catalyst. It's a lectin. It's a binding protein for carbohydrate. And it's been crystallized. Uh, this was up at Harvard a while back. And you can see now very little in terms of molecular information. At the bottom, I can see a carbohydrate. There's, there's the ligand for this molecule. There's the ligand over here for this molecule. But all of this stuff is just, it seems like barbed wire. It's just folded on top of itself. Now, you, most of you who are interested in going further in these subjects have to deal with this. Those are chemicals. Those are bonds. But you don't have the possibility to draw all those pictures because it's just ridiculously in terms of uh, how many there are. So I'll leave it there. Now, in terms of the chemistry that these things do, you'll talk about binding proteins. You've got amino acids, which are three-dimensional uh, molecules typically, and they can build three-dimensional structures. You take two molecules and build a bigger molecule, all of a sudden you've got more possibilities in terms of hydrogen bonding, in terms of their shape. And if you look at this molecule, this to me sort of, put, you know, it draws the line under where I stop and where the, the, uh, uh, Dr. Sarah, Dr. Sturman pick up. In this reaction, give me a chemical that you think would allow this to happen. What does it look like is happening? I have an O leaving, right? I have an O breaking off. And what would help or what would facilitate that O breaking off? Protonation. Protonation, right? Protonation is as simple as it gets. H plus. Atomic mass one. Yeah, that's it. Now, the biochemical equivalent of H plus is that. That's atomic mass or molecular mass of thousands and possibly hundreds of thousands. And there's a system I'm teaching in the other class which has a protein system, a complex, that has a formula weight of two million. Right? There's a big difference between one and two million. So you can see now that you're going to have to worry about three-dimensional. Again, you're going to have to worry about chirality again, because all these amino acids, are apart from one, are chiral. And they can produce beautiful and infinite three-dimensional structures, which then go together to be able to do different reactions. So let me just finish off by saying, this molecule is 3D, and it's chiral. And you bring another molecule into it, and there's a part of this molecule that accepts a certain ligand, that accepts a certain structure. This molecule on the left has some part of it that is designed to actually accept that molecule. It binds to it through hydrogen bonding to hold it in space. And then there's an acid catalyst close by, maybe a carboxylic acid, which transfers a proton. And then the leaving group breaks off and make a carbocation. And then the water comes in and you get a hydrolysis step. We've done that. That's acetal hydrolysis. But obviously, it's getting more complicated because the structures are getting bigger. Uh, other things that people have heard of, and uh, again, this is just to show you the differences in our worlds. This is a uh, cell membrane. 
cell membrane. This is a slide that uh, maybe my wife would use after the med school because this is showing bigger ideas using organic chemistry, using molecules, but for pharmacology to show where things dock, where things will attach to a, a, a cell, where cholesterol attaches or where a molecule goes through a lipid membrane, things like that. And you can see these marvelous motifs. To me, this is just a bunch of Tic Tacs and lozenges and various candy and things like that, but apparently they all mean something. Yeah, they all mean something. They're all big organic motifs. This little squiggle here, the seven transmembrane protein, right, which is attached to a, a G protein coupled receptor, those are incredibly important. Most of the pharmaceuticals that are out there uh, target this type of system. They target those types of proteins. So you're going to have to learn a lot about that if you're going to go to pharmacy and medicine. And that initiates some, something will dock at the outside here, and that will initiate some signal into the cell and then something else happens in the cell, either a good thing or a bad thing. So those things are huge targets. But again, that's biology, and that's sort of beyond my understanding, really, because it's so big. You will need to learn an alphabet. You can imagine now when we started out talking about organic chemistry that I introduced it as an alphabet, and I said if you could read music, you can do this stuff. If you can speak a foreign language with a different alphabet, you can do this stuff, organic chemistry, because it's really the same thing. You just have to learn it and practice it, and hopefully it, it picks up. You'll have to learn this. You're taking biochem, you'll memorize all those structures. Is that right? You memorize all those structures? Yes, you do. There are 20 of them. You have to know all of them. So how do they differ? Well, they differ in size. They differ in their complexity. They differ in their shape. Some of them are flat. Okay? They differ in whether they're chiral or achiral. Most of them are chiral. They differ in whether they have a cycle. And all of those little structures allow for three-dimensional shapes to develop. You start to put these things together, and maybe something starts to cyclize. Remember the Fisher depictions? It's almost as if they were starting to cyclize, similar to that. Or you get long chain things with molecules or attachments that repel each other. Or they repel water, they're hydrophobic. And then you can start thinking about three-dimensional structures being built up by using that alphabet. So English, 26 letters. Amino acid chemistry, 20 letters. That's really all it is. But then the inference after that is that all of these functional groups, a carboxylic acid, maybe that's a catalyst. Maybe that could serve as H+. This phenyl group right here, what would the pKa be of that OH group? About 10, right? It's a good system, good hydrogen bonding system. There's a molecule that has an acid attached. It could be acidic, it could be basic if you take off that proton. You will get familiar with those very quickly. I imagine it's the first semester of biochem. Yeah, pretty much immediately, you've got to learn that stuff and understand what they do. In terms of their chemistry, let's back off a little bit and let's look at them as organic chemists. Again, if you can do organic chemistry, you can do anything else. Calculus 7, engineering 33, whatever you take, you can do anything because you're a chemist. Top left, I've got the simplest example, which is uh, glycine, which is achiral, and that is a very simple organic molecule. I've been saying for weeks now that we're building up in terms of complexity by adding different functional groups. There you have a bifunctional molecule. At one end of the molecule, it's NH2, which is basic and nucleophilic. At the other end, you have a carboxylic acid, which is electrophilic or it's acidic. Not too complicated yet, but you start putting these things on, tryptophan, Thanksgiving, turkey, all this stuff, nice, flat, non-polar material. That will go places in terms of trying to find other non-polar material, they'll congregate together, and that will affect the shape of the protein. You can see here glutam glutamine, you have this uh, amide bond at the end, uh, glutamic acid, you have this extra carboxylic acid at the end, and what you'll find is that these OH carbonyl groups and the NH2 groups, they are used to knit or crochet the molecule together. They are used to put the pieces together, they are the linkages, and all these other functional groups are sticking off from those linkages, and they're floating in space and they can go do other things. So amino acids are going to be very complicated, but they are not anything more complicated than amides. And you think about why amides are used for this type of function. Why don't you want to use an ester? Well, they're both carboxylic acid derivatives. Carboxylic acids themselves are no use because there's nothing linked there. You just have an OH group. Esters could be used. Why weren't amino acids or why weren't uh, proteins uh, evolved from esters? Well, the problem with esters is they're not as stable as amides. Amides are more stable, they're more robust, they should last longer. That's exactly what they do. So keep an eye on the idea that they're simple chemicals. Now, between now and Friday, when I finish this little section off, we'll find that the chemistry to make these things is complicated in the lab, but fairly simple in nature. You could imagine taking three amino acids like this, with whatever R group we have attached. And we have an amino group at the end, which is nucleophilic. We have a carbonyl at this end, which is electrophilic. And you can knit these things together. What's the byproduct if you do that? Water, it's a condensation process through nucleophilic acyl substitution. There will be a protein involved, which is the equivalent of your cat H+, that you've seen many times in my class. 
And if you do this in biology, you have no problems with these things lining up selectively. The proteins are developed to catch one amino acid and catch another and put, put them together, catch another one, put them together. There's no problems like we have with crossed aldols and crossed clasins where you get messes. If you threw these three amino acids together in the lab, you'd get this reacting with itself, you get this reacting with itself, that reacting with itself, you get this reacting with this one, this one reacting with this one, you get a mess. You get something like nine compounds because there's no selectivity. So what we have to do as chemists is a little bit of uh, protecting chemistry. That's expensive, it takes time, but it's necessary. So we're going to form things called polypeptides, and maybe that's the first time I've used the word poly. Polypeptide, polysaccharide, poly means many. Many units joined together to make a bigger system. Right now, if I asked you to take a molecule like this and I added a base, what do you think would happen? It would deprotonate the carboxylic acid. So you're learning now to focus on the important part of the molecule. That's hopefully the, the key from my class to going into the bigger classes is focus on the important stuff. Get rid of the noise, go for the important stuff. Uh, if I were to add a proton, an acid source, where would it go? The amine group at the end, yeah? Because that's more basic than the amides. The amides are stuck in the amide bond. So now we've got some sort of idea of where you need to be. Well, to make those peptide bonds is nothing more complicated than making an amide. In the lab, we would use an acid chloride or an anhydride, react it with an amine, and you get an amide very quickly. No problem at all there. But now, all of a sudden, the language starts to change. You've learned amide, 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 whatever you want to call it. You're now going to call them peptides. If they're between two amino acids, they get the name peptide, but it is nothing more complicated than an amide bond. And you'll find that these things are strong, and they're flat. They are planar. You get delocalization from nitrogen, and that gives that some structure. So there we are. Uh, what I'll finish up with today, give you a couple of minutes on this, and then we can do this evaluation stuff. And then Friday, I will be um, into lipids, I hope. Now, here's the problem. If you're interested in this stuff, take an upper division class, one of the organic classes. This is the problem we have as organic chemists trying to mimic nature. We're trying to make peptides, trying to make small molecules that might have some biological function, like, like insulin, right? Insulin is a polypeptide. We can make it. But making it is difficult because if you have two letters here, A and B, and you simply mix them without any protecting groups, you get all possible products. Because this end of the molecule can react with another molecule of itself, or it can react with this, and this can react with itself, and you get four possibilities. This is exactly the same as the crossed aldol cross clasin problem. You're going to get mixtures. So what we need to do is to protect. This is just FYI, but the chemistry here isn't that difficult. If you protect selectively one end of the molecule by putting a protecting group on there, you would learn that later if you're interested, and you protect this molecule over here by protecting it, you then have this hydroxyl and this amide free to actually, oh, sorry, this, this carboxylic acid and this amine free to go after each other. And you use some reagent, you don't know what DCC is, but you learn about it in 5821 or my class, dicyclohexyl carbidiimid, and you can dehydrate, very powerful dehydrating agent, which then removes the molecular water through essentially an acyl substitution reaction, and you get the peptide. And that peptide is then going to need to get deblocked and that's expensive and time consuming, but then you get your clean peptide. Now, what do you think? Anybody, any ideas as to how you can improve on this? If biology can do it in one step without any protecting groups, and we're stuck doing five, six, seven steps and protecting chemistry, how do you think you can make this work easier? Well, the answer is chemical biology. The answer is go work out what enzymes are involved in the system and then isolate them and then make it work in a test tube. Okay, that's a huge subject these days. It's taking biological systems, working it down to the basics that are needed to make the compound you want, making it work in a test tube, and then accelerating it, then making it work for you on scale. And people are doing that with all kinds of things now. They're making medicines that way, using animals as the surrogate, using animals as a test tube. It's a huge subject. So I'm going to sort of uh, finish off by showing you some of these protecting groups. I'm going to talk about insulin for a second, then I'm out. That's a big molecule. That's insulin. But as far as biochemical goes, biochemistry goes, that's not a big molecule at all. That's fairly simple. You have a whole bunch of amino acids joined together in a certain sequence, and at certain parts in this molecule, you have these linkages, disulfide linkages. You'll learn about those. Useful ways of linking chains within chains. So how do we make that? Well, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort because you have to add blocking groups to all your amino acids. You then have to couple them. You then have to de-block them. And if you follow this through, you've only got a dipeptide so far. And this thing has something like 30 amino acids. So you've got to do that again, and again, and again, and again. And as most of you have learned in lab, very few of you get 100% yield. Yeah? 
usually 35% yield is, is something to write home about. So every time you do this, you lose material. Even if you're the best chemist in the world, you lose material. So you start out with a kilogram of stuff. At the end of the day, you're down to a gram, you're down to milligrams. That's expensive. That's expensive, and it's, uh, it'd be easier if we had other ways of doing it. So I'm going to leave it there. I'll come back to this on Friday. Uh, these evaluations, um, if you think of anything that we could do better, let me know.